Welcome to the night studio here at the museum. I'm Sonia Gavankar for this edition of Inside Media. The wonderful studio audience will be here helping me with this conversation. We have two fantastic guests, one to work on your mind and one to work on your stomach. We have a great husband and wife team here. We have Chris Wallace and Lorraine Wallace with her book, she's the author here, with Mr. Sunday's Saturday Night Chicken and of course, Chris Wallace from Fox News. Please welcome them. Now, I was telling Mrs. Wallace back in the, control, in the uh, green room that I am a horrible cook, and I am very scared of chicken, so I look forward to being empowered during this conversation, and of course, the studio audience who will be helping me with questions through the next 30 minutes is here as well in the night studio here at the museum. So to get started, Mrs. Wallace, is a way to a man's stomach really through, or a way to a man's heart really through his stomach? I think so. Uh, Chris has soup on Sunday and chicken on Saturday. And that's maybe how you got in on his good side? It tell us how you met. I just like to make him comfortable, and guys don't like change. <laughs> well, I, I will add to this, actually, because I, <laughs> it's a little more complicated, but food has something to do with it. So I'd been married, and now I was single, and I was single, I divorced and single for about three or four years, and I used to go out with these young 30-year-olds, and... Thanks. What? <laughs> well, I was in my 30s when well, you met me. I know, but you weren't a young 30-year-old, and you had two children. In any case, real quickly, <laughs> I, I would always go in, and I'd go into the refrigerator, and you would see these girls, very pretty, glamorous, and they would have uh, like a, a bottle of champagne and some half-eaten chicken, uh, I mean, uh, Chinese food. And when I went to see Lorraine out in the country, in the Plains, Virginia, of all places, I opened the refrigerator, and there was this big refrigerator filled with food and a roasted chicken and, you know, salad and dressing, and I thought, I'm home. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us, have you always been a cook? Have you been just a master chef your entire life? Well, I wasn't when I was single, but I think when you have young children, and I lived on a farm, and it was nice to, with them to plant gardens in the spring, and that was a way that we would go gather our vegetables or herbs and things. And also when they were little, I'd go to orchards and pumpkin patches and do purees and freeze them for their baby food. So it was kind of a, a path of learning. And one thing, just like you, I learned to boil water. <laughs> it's a slow process for me. I'm going to be inspired through this book. Tonight I've decided to make the recipe on page 163. It's sesame chicken. I hope to not call in sick tomorrow from work because of a mistake I made with your fabulous recipe. Now you have great recipes in here, but you also have beautiful pictures of your family and your friends as well. Tell us about that. Well, it is a little more than a cookbook. It's kind of a family album of photographs and stories and every chicken recipe kind of talks about what, what the inspiration or which member of our family made a contribution. So um, it's, it's exciting in that regard and it was fun to write. And Mr. Wallace, what's your... Uh, recipe in this book? Or are you just the taste tester? I'm, I'm an eater. I don't, I, I, I contribute nothing to this except uh, my, my comments on it. And I must, will say there were a few that didn't make because I said, you know, and that didn't quite work. Really? No, it's, they're not, That's nobody true. bats a thousand, Sonia. <laughs> but, but they were, you know, and people say to me, like, do you, have you tasted all these recipes? I said, I, I ate all these recipes. I mean, this is. You live them. I live these recipes, you know. Real quickly, the story, Mr. Sunday Saturday Night Chicken, is, as I assume most of you know, I do a Sunday talk show, and the Saturday before the first show, obviously a certain amount of nerves, starting a new enterprise, uh, Lorraine said, what do you want to eat? And chicken, I genuinely do love chicken, and, I, and it's kind of comfort food, and I said, how about chicken? She cooked it, show went very well, next week, next Saturday, what do you want? How about chicken? So, and, and now it's been eight and a half years and we've, I've had chicken, I would say 95% of the time, Saturday nights for the last eight and a half years. When I go to Iowa for a caucus, I'll order a steak, but. but and he's like cheating. It, really? It's like cheating, having a steak on a Saturday night. And that's the only cheating, <laughs> darling. Yes. <laughs> is this what it's like in your kitchen as you're cooking? Is the family all around? Or are you working in the office and really well, he's in like in his library. Mm -hmm. Or watching the golf or something on television. But, but no, I sometimes come in and we, t and we chat. And in fact, we've been in a, uh, in, in a makeshift place for about four or five months because 
as a result of her being this great cookbook author, she's getting a new kitchen. So we're been Don't out I of have our a good house. Husband. And this is gonna be, <laughs> and this is gonna be like twice as big as the one we had, so I think I'm gonna actually be in the kitchen while she's cooking. I can't stop cooking now. <laughs> It makes me feel like there's another book maybe in the works. This is Mr. Sunday, know. Mrs. Sunday's new kitchen cookbook, something in the works? Something like that. You don't know. <laughs> what do you that think? sounds like something to pitch to the IRS. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about you, Mr. Wallace, for a second. Let's talk about let's what- Let's make it Chris and Lorraine. Okay, okay, that, Chris and Lorraine. Let's talk about Fox News for a little bit in the campaign season. We're, we're in it and, and you've been doing loads of interviews and keeping us all up to date. What should we be looking forward to in the next couple of months as we gear up to the conventions? Well, I mean, I, I, no great insight here. The thing you should really be looking forward to in the next week is this monumental decision on health care reform. Uh, I was reading Tom Goldstein, who writes something called SCOTUS Blog, and is one of the really informed court watchers, and obviously there's a whole kind of sub-industry of that, says that he thinks this is, this is one of the biggest rulings in terms of its effect on people's daily lives that the court will have made in the last century. Uh, you know, regardless of whether they decide whether they uphold the law, whether they strike it down, whether they strike down part of it. Uh, I mean, you're talking about one-sixth of our economy, health care. You're talking about a, a real statement uh, as to whether the government can tell individuals they have to buy a, a product. Uh, whether they have to tell companies they have to supply a product. So, I mean, the whole question of the relationship between government and the individual, the role of government, without saying whether it's good or bad, a lot of that is going to be dramatically affected by what the court says, and it'll be this week. I, you know, I, when people say pins and ne needles, it really is. I mean, I, it tells you what my life is like, but at 10 o'clock, Every day this last week and starting tomorrow, I'm sitting there watching Fox News, I'm looking at, my, at the internet trying to see, is today the day they're going to announce the decision? Excellent. I want to remind our studio audience you are part of this conversation, so if you do have a question, please raise your hand nice and high so I can see it and we can go to your question. I'm going to start over here with this gentleman in a yellow shirt, and then if we can get a microphone over here. Do do you feel uh, that President Obama even expected to get all the mandates in the health care originally, or is it just that Congress kind of was so one-sided they just were going to shove down everything, whether that he was expecting to have something so broad actually passed? Well, if you remember during the campaign, he was against the mandate, and in fact, he made a lot of the arguments against it that conservatives now make, and it was a big point of division between him and Hillary Clinton. She was said, you have to have the mandate. And, and the argument as to why you have to, I mean, there really are only sort of two ways to make this kind of health care reform work. Either you have a single payer plan, government control of the whole thing, or you have a mandate and the private system, because the only way you're going to get the kinds of reforms that they're talking about here, in, for instance, the idea that, that uh, you couldn't be excluded from coverage if you have a pre-existing condition, is you have to have this huge flood of new customers. So you need something that's going to, that's how the insurance companies are willing to make this deal, is if they have some mechanism where they get all these new customers so then they can afford, in the case of people with pre-existing conditions, to cover people who have illnesses when they, when they come into the plan. In a great this is your life sort of moment, I'd like to go to our next audience member for your question. You have the next question. Well, Chris, uh, just a reminder that you and I uh, got on live on CBS's convention coverage when we were both college students and I was your father's intern. But, I'm sorry, uh, you your I father's was, intern. If you want to stand up for us, I'm not sure if Chris can see you pass the, uh, pass the, pass the camera there. Uh, but uh, let me have a question, uh, ask a question about the book, which sure. is uh, my wife wants to know what was the most extreme substitution you've ever had to make? And introduce yourself to everyone here in the audience. Extreme substitution. No, no, go ahead. What were you going to say? I'm Adam Powell. I used to be here in the museum, oh, and I'm, I'm now retired. Hi. No, you worked with his father as an intern? I was at CBS for 16 years. Huh? Wow. Right. Wonderful. Um, well, I believe in substitution all the time, because often we go to the market and we don't have what we thought we needed for a recipe and you're reading down. So, you know, being an at-home cook, I think if you have a red pepper and it calls for a green pepper, go ahead and use it. And you know, if you, if you think a spice you like prefer other than something else, put that in. Some people don't like cilantro. They're like, ooh, cilantro. Well, put basil in, so, or flat leaf parsley. So I think you can substitute anything anyway. The beauty of chicken is it's very neutral. And one of the things that I discovered 
when preparing these 100 recipes was how versatile it is. It's like a blank canvas to a painter, to a cook, because you can, you can pound it, you can bake it, you can barbecue it, you can put it on kebabs, you can... Boil it, as I found out earlier? You can poach it for salads. I it's it's just so, it's so easy. And it's in, actually, people eat chicken two to three times a week. So it's nutritious, too. Organic cooking was something that is very important to you as well, and organic pro produce and, and vegetables. Tell us well, about that. I think there's a real movement for that. I think it tastes better. It costs a little more. But if you can buy anything that is local and, and fresh, it's just better. It tastes better, and it's less expensive because it hasn't been trucked you know, miles and miles to get to your table. Chris, I should have asked you what you had for dinner last night. Oops. I mean, uh, what are you going to look forward oh, well, to having? We having cheated it? a little bit. I'm just trying to, listen, I sometimes can't remember who I had on the show this morning, but <laughs> I'm at that age. But, but we true. cheated because we are moving back into our house, and so she got a chicken from Wagshaw's. That's still, that's and still, Wagshaw's but it was chicken. Chicken <laughs> is in this book because they're a deli in Spring Valley, and they make a wonderful roasted chicken, and uh, the one that we like happens to be stuffed, so there's no calories. I love wild yeah, shows. I mean, it was like it was like Thanksgiving at the Wallaces last night. We had we had the roast chicken with stuffing and cranberry. Very delicious. Nice. <laughs> Excellent. Another question over here on our second row. Go ahead, sir. So, how do you come up with your recipes? Do you just think uh, just have a chicken there and think, uh, you know, what can I put in it? Do you just start throwing things together, or do you start off? Well, I uh, think um, I think I go to restaurants with Chris or something and I'll see something or I'll have a food experience and I'll think, wow, I can do this with chicken. Like uh, normally you would have veal marango and here I have chicken marango. You know, so you can adapt um, ingredients and switch them out because chicken is versatile. So I think I just, I think my eyes, I just, I cook with my eyes and smell and that's how it comes about. And you have I, a lot I, of I have to just say one thing and, and it, one of the many things I'm in awe of my wife about is we'll go to a restaurant and she will say, do you taste the whatever in it? And I'm like, yeah, it's good. She, and she goes, no, no, do you taste the, and a, a specific ingredient? And she will, while we're just eating at a restaurant, deconstruct it, and then she will go home and try to reconstruct it and, and try to recreate it. I mean, this is long before she was doing the cookbooks. I mean, I think, just think you have a wonderful uh, taste and sensitivity to what goes into Thank making you. a delicious meal. And I think reading with your eyes, I think pretty pictures of food in magazines and you kind of look at the picture and go, oh, I can do that. And it's, it's a lot of fun. And you have a lot of recipes in here from chefs, from friends of yours who are chefs, so they yeah. appreciate your, Some your palate as well. Some uh, Washington landmarks. We have uh, Chef Art Smith of Art and Soul, who's just around the corner here, has two kinds of his fried chicken. Uh, he's recently gotten married, and he was a little heavy, and he's dropped like 35 pounds. The first one is his traditional bone-in uh, fried chicken from the south, uh, deep fried. And the second is he takes it and he pounds the chicken breast, and he puts panko breadcrumbs and dips it back in the egg and then the panko breadcrumbs and bakes it, and it's very good with a little hot sauce. Mm. Another question in the back here. Go ahead. Favorite recipes are in the book, uh, both of you, and what was your father's favorite recipe? Well, unfortunately, this book came out uh, after uh, he, uh, before he died, rather. So I'm not sure that. Well, I made him summer chicken three summers ago in the vineyard. Did remember? you? He liked it. Yeah. Well, he he loved uh, he he loved all of her recipes, and he was certainly involved with the with the soup cookbook. My favorite is called Not Fried Chicken, and. You know, it's sort of like fried chicken without the guilt. It, it, she'll tell you how it's made, but it's, as I assume, I, I, when I hear it's essentially baked, and then she rolls it instead of, you know, the fried skin, she rolls it in crushed cornflakes. And so it looks like fried chicken, it tastes like fried chicken, it smells like fried chicken, but it, it's not fried chicken. It does make your house smell good. <laughs> and it packs great. It's so nice to just pack and take for picnics or potlucks or anything like that. And your favorite recipe? They're all my babies. <laughs> how, can, how can I have a favorite? Well, speaking of your babies, you have a wonderful blended family. Did your cooking, you know, soup on Saturday, chicken on, no, I've already had that wrong. Chicken on Saturday, soup on Sunday. Is that something that you organized to keep your family more on schedule? Absolutely. Our son Remick is here somewhere, uh, back there in the green shirt. Go ahead, shirt. wave, Remick. <laughs> and, um, 
he was a freshman in high school when Chris took the job. He just graduated from Rhodes College this May. And uh, he was being recruited for baseball. And so I didn't have time to make breakfast when Chris would walk in the door on a Sunday at 11.15. So I came up with making a soup. And he would roll out of bed, and we would go to 126 games a year. Wow. And Chris would go upstairs with our dog and the newspapers and fall yeah, this asleep. Was the, the, the family togetherness time was the time we were eating soup. <laughs> For 20 minutes. The table. Well, first of all, I'd come home. And you're, you know, I have to get up at 5 o'clock on Sunday mornings. And so I get home. It's 1130. And I'm hungry, certainly, and maybe a little tired. And there's some homemade soup bubbling uh, on the stovetop. And it smells delicious. And I'm ending my day. Remick was just beginning his day then. Those double headers, two, so, so two hours away. So up, I'd be, and, and I'd be winding down, and we'd all sit around the table for about half an hour and eat soup. And uh, Even our dog. Yes, he Winston had a little ramp would, would have his little thing. Of Real soup. Winston goes crazy. Oh, yeah. You pull out the soup pot and that, he starts doing flips. That doesn't recommend her soup. Winston would literally <laughs> eat anything. So. <laughs> he loves chicken, too. <laughs> So would you ever open a restaurant? Maybe call it Winston's, just throwing it out there, maybe? Um, I wanted to do maybe a food truck called In the Soup. Oh. But I haven't gotten that away. But she's got a kitchen at this point, so she's going to focus I'm on I'm grateful that. for my kitchen. I'm grateful for my kitchen. You're grateful for the kitchen? Yes, Are husband. you supportive of the food truck idea? Not particularly. <laughs> OK, well, at least well, we have I mean, the... there's a lot of overhead. you got to deal. I mean, the, no, that, was, that would be hard. But, you want to keep uh, her to yourself, I, I see. I don't have any choice in the matter. You have to get a professional chicken. Salute. You have to get a kitchen that's professional, okay. and it all has to be inspected. I mean, it's, no, who has time for that? We'll just all come over for dinner tonight. There that's, you fine. Go. that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Sign a waiver. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the fun things is you have a recipe in here from Carl Rove. Yes. So you've talked to him as a colleague and interviewed him during the presidency. So what's it like having him in your wife's book well, as a, I'll, I'll a just, chef? I'll go just quickly, because I know what, you guys are not all just foodies, you're also newsies. I would say that there is a bigger discrepancy between the public and, and real persona of Karl Rove than almost any public figure I've met. And I didn't know him particularly well when I first came to Fox, and even for a long time while I was at Fox, and he was not going out and talking to the media a lot, uh, I had very much the impression of this political shark and, 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 you know, and, and a very much a tough guy. In fact, and I really have gotten to know Carl since uh, 2007 or 8 when he left the White House and became a contributor at Fox News as a colleague, I've gotten to know him quite well. And I would say that there is nobody, uh, first of all, he's absolutely brilliant in his political perceptions, his ability to analyze numbers on a primary night. We had a decision team with all the exit polls and the desk, and Carl, just with a, an envelope and his, and his uh, pen on the back of the envelope calculating, would know who had won the primary before all of our decision desks did. But the thing that's so different is he is the most collegial, uh, warm. fun, warm, inviting fun. guy to be around. And at some point, he invited me to go quail hunting with him uh, on this little leasehold he has in, in southwestern southeastern Texas, near Corpus Christi, the Armstrong Ranch, and I, you know, I'm a city boy. I had no idea, but I went out to a range here in, in Prince George's County and shot a couple of times, and I ended up going down to the ranch and actually shot three quail. I was very impressed by that. My son, when I told him I was going quail hunting, he said, those are the safest birds on the face <laughs> of the earth. But in any case, and as a result of this, he brought them back and Lorraine cooked them. And we do have a quail recipe from Carl in here. And uh, he's in awe because quail are, I don't mean to, if there's a society here for the, uh, you know, preservation of quail, I don't mean in any way to denigrate them. They're pretty tough. And she found a way to make quail well, tender. They are very tough. Um, unfortunately, the recipe that Carl gave me is one that I tried when he shipped a whole trunk, frozen trunk of this stuff up to me. <laughs> and I went, what am I supposed to do with this? And he goes, well, I'm in Houston or Austin, and then I'm going to California. And I'm like, OK. He said, just, I'll deal with it. I'll deal with it, because they were coming over to dinner. And so I get his recipe on the internet, and I am doing it. It's basically. Uh, some Greek seasoning and some olive oil, and uh, you let it sit overnight, and that, that's it. That's about it. Oh, jalapeno juice from the jalapenos mm -hmm. in the jar. And then you take it and you take some bacon and you put some of these jalapenos underneath the bacon and you grill it. 
Well, you could throw it against a wall. <laughs> it was like nothing there to break down um, the bird. So we added some secret things. So. Oh. And now he keeps calling me and saying, what, can you send me that recipe? But so his recipe is in here. Yes, and it's okay, but uh, you so might want to. This is the one that they throw, can throw against the yeah, wall. Right. A, no, but I'm sure so you, you, you changed it a Carl little bit. Recipe for the but quiet. it's a good story. <laughs> Just add some sweetness to it to break it down like orange juice or something. <laughs> well, Chris, you come from a long family of newsmen. Can you tell us the progression of how you've seen the industry change in the last couple of years? Oh my gosh, I mean, it's, in the it's, next it's two and, minutes? And going back. <laughs> it's unrecognizable. It really has changed so much. When, when I started in the news business, I, I graduated from college in 1969. I started in newspapers uh, because I thought that, and I had people suggest to me that, that writing and reporting for newspapers was a much better way to learn the trade than television. Uh, because you have to report and write in so much greater depth. But after about three years, I, I, I went into television working for a local station in Chicago, and then I went to a local station in New York, and then, and then started at NBC to get away from CBS. Uh, but, you know, back in the old days, you either, in, particularly in television, you worked in local news, or, and if, you know, if you were really good and really lucky, you might end up at a network. And there were three networks, and that was the universe. And I was talking to somebody the other day, I, I covered the Reagan administration from, uh, I was the chief White House correspondent for NBC covering Ronald Reagan from 1982 to 1988, the last six years of his presidency, and there were the three, Sam Donaldson, Leslie Stahl, and me. I think CNN had just started, but they were very much on the fringes, and, and that was the universe. And if, if you, an interesting thing for you to do, it, 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 for you, those of you who are out of towners, is to drive past, or you can't literally drive past the White House anymore, that's a change. You have to walk past because Pennsylvania Avenue is shut to traffic. But there's a whole area there now called Pebble Beach. There are these stands. There used to just be three spots, and you would be on the lawn, and you would be uh, with a tree, and the White House would be directly behind you. Now, between local stations and cable and internet, there must be a hundred different outlets there in addition to obviously all the print outlets and all the internet and all the blogs, it is just a completely different world. And in some respects, I think it's better. I, you know, there's more democracy, there's more checking, it's not as authoritarian, it's not as much top down. I, on the other hand, I think it puts more of a, uh, of a burden on you as a news consumer because some of them, some of these sources uh, have tremendous editorial processes, even if there's a bias, liberal or conservative, whatever you think, but you know that there's a, a lot of checks and balances, and some of them not so much. So it puts more of a, a burden on you as a news consumer to figure out: is this just you know some guy sitting in a pajama, in pajamas in his mother's basement writing this, or is this somebody who really knows what he's talking about and you know has editors and somebody fa checking his facts? What do you think about the recent uh, dust up between the Daily Caller reporter who yelled out a question during the president's prepared remarks? I thought it was absolutely unacceptable. Uh, I was there during an extremely aggressive time for White House reporters, as I say, Sam Donaldson was there for ABC and Leslie Stahl for CBS and me for NBC, and none of us were shrinking violets. And, and, and Reagan, as opposed to most presidents really ever since George H.W. Bush, liked to engage. You asked him a question, he would, uh, he would answer it. Famously, I remember during the 84 campaign, uh, Walter Mondale, who was running against Reagan, was making some allegation, and Andrea Mitchell, my colleague at NBC, yelled at him in the Rose Garden, what, what do you think about Mondale's charges, Mr. President? And he turned around without missing a beat and said, I think he should pay them. <laughs> so, so in any case, but the point was, you waited until he was finished to, to shout the question, to, in the, to interrupt a president in the middle of prepared remarks, and you know, he said, well, I just mistimed it. No, he was interrupting the president absolutely unacceptable and disrespectful. Nothing to do with who the president is. It's the president. You let him finish, then you shout questions. We have some more questions from our audience right here in the back. Go ahead. Chris, uh, uh, I'm, Lu I'm Louis Feinstein down from New York City. Uh, my grandparents used to love uh, watching your dad on, on TV. They spoke about him all the time. I have two short comments. One on the last point that you made. I, I did read in the Times that the reporters have complained that the president doesn't really take questions, that at, at his conferences he speaks and he walks off. And so there was commentary that that was really the only way the reporter could get his question in. 
The second point is just humorously, if you do continue quail hunting, I would imagine that um, uh, you won't invite uh, Dick Cheney to, uh, <laughs> to quail hunt. This was actually perhaps, close to where Dick Cheney uh, to go the fishing. Armstrong Ranch. Uh, it is true, the president doesn't answer questions. Really, nobody has since, since Reagan. I mean, Bush didn't, Clinton didn't, uh, W. Bush didn't. And you know, they're the president and they cannot answer questions, but you can't interrupt the president. He's, you gotta pay him the courtesy of letting him answer his prepared statement, uh, make, finish his prepared statement. And I know uh, Tucker Carlson, who was this fellow's boss at the Daily Caller, said, well, Sam Donaldson did it, and Sam immediately responded, no, I didn't. I never interrupted the president. Another question in the back. Yes. It's such a great honor for all of us. We all feel really lucky and such a special treat that you both are here. And especially what's really refreshing and beautiful is to see your loving romantic relationship, which is so nice in this modern age to see that. And it's very inspiring and good example. And it reminds me of an ancient saying in Sanskrit, yad yad acharti shreshtas, tat tat eva trojana, sayat pramanam kurute, lokas tat anuvartate. And in English, that means whatever action uh, great people perform, common men follow in their footsteps. And whatever standards they set by exemplary acts, all the world pursues. So you both are a, such a sweet, loving example of husband and wife. And it's just so, it just makes you really happy just to see your chemistry and your love. And, and I'm sure that brings so much out in your cooking, too. I mean, that, that love must really be at your dinner table. Yes, uh, cooking is love. I mean, when you get your family together and they're enjoying it and everybody's chatting around the table. It's a lot of fun and you get great satisfaction as a chef. And then you don't mind trying something again. My Sonia over here who's I, beginning to cook. <laughs> I'm, I'm inspired and empowered from this book. So tell chicken. me, I'm going to make the page 163 sesame chicken tonight. So what is being, uh, what, I know you're making your big move tomorrow back to the refurbished home. So what's uh, the first thing you're gonna cook in your new kitchen? Oh, I have no idea. Oh. I have to get it unpacked first. <laughs> and, and, and we hate to say this, it's, it's not, not going to be ready September. for two months. So. <laughs> so you have plenty of time to decide yeah. and try out some new things. Maybe a book will be on how to cook with a microwave. <laughs> oh. <laughs> with a hot plate. Or That's hot more hot my plate. speed. How to cook with a hot plate. That's or, more or, my or speed. Or Chris, go get takeouts for us tonight. Well, that sounds good. Thank you so much for both of you for being here today. Thank and you remember, so much. there is a book signing of this wonderful cookbook at the end of the Internet TV and Radio Gallery in the next couple of minutes. I highly recommend it, and I think I'm going to be inspired. I think you're going to email me and let me know how you I, do. I will. Okay. I'm going to send you some pictures of hopefully not a whole lot of smoke billowing from my kitchen. <laughs> Sonia says she gets very impatient. I'm very impatient. <laughs> Once again, thank you so much for joining us, Lorraine Wallace and Chris Wallace, here in the night studio at the museum. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.